then I'd like to touch on um, some impressions of some of the directors uh, that you've worked with, people like Robert Aldridge and yeah. uh, David Lean. Uh, Fine. But fo the primarily okay. focus on, on okay. the film. How often do we reload or don't we reload? It'll be one hour straight through. Either one yeah. time. Okay. <coughs> Carter, yeah. you could go out and do your shopping, sweetheart. We'll be an hour. Isn't it? Well, no, but, I mean, Are you sure? You and Deb could take the car. Well, Darling? Darling, we're going to be an hour, an hour and a quarter, something if we're yeah, going to I see. Can't do it in the, what I need to do in time. Gorgeous. You okay? You ready? So, Richard Attenborough, congratulations on your new feature film, Chaplin. Thank you, John. As well as your 50th anniversary in the motion picture business, <laughs> which <laughs> yes. starting. Uh, in, as your appearance in, in which we serve, the David right. Lee Noel Coward right. film, which we'll touch on a little bit later. Uh, Chaplin, um, his extraordinary uh, biography, you've of course made several extraordinary biographical films. What was it that attracted you to this particular subject? Uh, well, <coughs> I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't read fiction very much. I, I read biography, I read history. I read social history, and the world around me and uh, what's going on around me is is what interests me. And um, I'm fascinated by the people who've changed our attitude towards accepted uh, authority, accepted criteria in relation to the manner in which we conduct our lives in our supposed civilized society. I'm fascinated by those who've revealed things to us in terms of human relationship and the way we view each other's problems and so on. And uh, one of the things I wanted to do was to make a film uh, in the usual genre that I'm in of, of, uh, of biopics, whatever the terrible word is that they're called. And I wanted to make a film about Thomas Paine. And I worked a long time, over two years, with a marvelous writer called Trevor Griffiths, who wrote Reds. And unfortunately, terrific script though it is, uh, the deal that I had was with Universal. And Universal, when they finally got it and looked at a possible budget, the budget was, oh, 65, 70 million. I mean, there was no way in which they were going to go forward with it. I mean, they knew what the subject was. They knew we'd got the American War of Independence and the French Revolution, so it wasn't going to cost a few bob, you know. <laughs> it was going to be quite expensive, but nevertheless, it was too much. And my partner in my company, a very old friend um, called Diana Hawkins, who had worked, well, we've worked together on and off for 30 years or so, um, she was as devastated as I was. And when we got back home, uh, to England, she decided to uh, go into a corner for a couple of days, and we weren't quite sure what she was up to. But she apparently wrote down a number of things which interest me: biography, uh, the movies, uh, people who've affected our lives, etc., etc., etc. And then the following day, after she'd written these down, she was at a meeting. She told me, and she suddenly wrote down CC. And she read Charlie's autobiography. She read, whether she read them both, I'm not sure at that time, but she certainly read Charlie's autobiography. She wrote, read the definitive biography by David Robinson. And she wrote a 20-page outline. And she gave it to me. And it was one of the most marvelous presents I've ever had in my life. Um, I, 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 I couldn't believe why I hadn't thought of it before, you know. Because being, as I say, interested in biography and fascinated by, uh, by my business, the business that I'm in, by the business that I've lived in for this half century, 
it seemed a natural. And yet, I immediately thought, well, I suppose the reason that nobody's done it is that Charlie didn't want a movie made about it, and perhaps Una didn't want one made after he died. However, I'd met Charlie in the 50s, and uh, as a result of that, he and Una asked if I would take Annie, one of their daughters, as a trainee on A Bridge Too Far, which is a picture I directed. And uh, I did, and so I got to know Annie and her sister, Vicky, and I rang the girls in Paris and said, asked them what they thought. And they repeated that, that Mummy had always said no, but they felt that there was perhaps a chance since I knew Daddy and Daddy was very sweet to me and very generous to me, uh, and that Mummy uh, could practically recite uh, uh, the screenplay of Gandhi, that perhaps I had a chance. Anyway, the great thing was to ask Geraldine. And Geraldine was the boss. So I rang Geraldine, who I'd never met, oddly enough, in Madrid, and Geraldine said, well, I don't know, she said, I mean, uh, in theory, the, has the answer has to be no, but... Uh, if anybody could persuade Mummy, I'm sure you probably could, write to us. I wrote to her. I got an immediate reply saying the answer was yes. And when I asked for an explanation, apparently in debate she'd said, well, somebody's going to make it sooner or later. Better to have someone make it who I know and who I think will do a truthful movie than leave it to chance. But she said, there is one condition. So I thought, oh my God, it's going to be that you know, her son is to play Charlie or somebody else is to write the script or whatever. Not a bit of it. The condition was that there were no conditions. She didn't want to know who was playing it. She didn't want to know who wrote the script or who was going to write the script. She, she didn't want any part of it whatsoever. She didn't even, I think, want to see the movie, necessarily. No chapter of his life was taboo? None. Just None. Nothing. And uh, she said, look, I, I will try as well as I may uh, to be objective, but I know it won't work. I know it'll be impossible. There will be things which subconsciously I will marginalize or accentuate, or, and they'll be wrong. You must make your film. But in furtherance of my desire that you should make a totally honest film and make your film, you can come to Veve. You can come to the home, to the family home in Switzerland, and the archives are open to you. 18 mil, 16 mil, stills, scripts, anything you want, private letters, diaries, nothing was taboo. And so it was the most wonderful gift at the end of the day um, that Diana had given me. And, and we set about, it's taken us four, four, four and a half years, something like that. And the movie is the result of that idea of hers. So in terms of the research alone, uh, it's a staggering mm. task mm. to obviously see all the films, mm. uh, the diaries. I mean, it must have been just a wonderful, you know, illuminating view of Chaplin. You, there must have been things about Chaplin that you hadn't known. Yes, I, I, I think there were. I mean, I have to say that I didn't have to start at zero, as it were. Um, when I was 11 in the early 30s, uh, my dad, we, we lived in the, in the Midlands, in the middle of England, and, and he brought me up to London uh, to go to, some, to the National Gallery, but also, as he put it, to see a genius. And the genius that he took me to see was Chaplin. And it was a cinema, it doesn't exist anymore, or well, the building does, but it didn't call that anymore. It was called the London Pavilion in Piccadilly Circus, and they were showing the gold rush. And uh, when I was five or six or eight or whatever it is, I wanted to be an actor. But if somebody said, what actually confirmed that passion of yours? It was seeing that movie. I'm quite sure about that. And I've said this over 20, 30 years. It isn't just related conveniently to this movie. Um, and I, 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 I remember, oy, I remember crying with laughter. You know, I mean, laughing so much that I thought I couldn't watch the screen almost. You know? And then, of course, he made me really cry. And I thought, well, that's magic. I mean, that's, that's extraordinary. That's incredible. And then, as I say, I met him in the 50s. So it, I, didn't have to, I didn't have to start from scratch. From the moment I saw the gold rush, I saw everything. Everything that was available to be seen 
Of course, a number of them hadn't been made yet, but uh, those that had been made and that were available, I saw. Oh, it was, uh, it was a revelation to me, an absolute revelation. And I, I'm profoundly ever in his debt, because I think in some measure, for good or ill, uh, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. Well, truly, uh, Chaplin was able to you know, blend humor with pathos, and to take slapstick and that type of humor a step further into a deeper humanity. And, and yeah. certainly a, a scene that, that really comes to mind is, is, is the uh, finale of The Kid, with oh, Jackie yes. Coogan, which, Oy. of course, you use the clip in... Uh, in a yeah, devastating, isn't it? I mean, it's extraordinary that... Uh, somebody wrote an article the other day saying how embarrassingly sentimental uh, the end of The Kid was. I mean, they just are... I mean, they shouldn't write articles like that if they're not uh, knowledgeable of the context of that. I mean, you know, the period when that was written, when melodrama was only just coming to an end, you know, the, the, the Victorian era had, uh, had not been over long. And uh, that was, I mean, when you consider that what had been movies up to a short period before that were custard pies and keystone cop chases, and suddenly, here was this incredible man, this genius, who said, hey, hey, this isn't, there are no limitations on this. This isn't a peep show at the end of the seaside pier. This is an art form. We can relate this to human beings. We can, we, we can, we can reveal, we can remove the onion skins. We can, we can show people's fallibilities, shortcomings, pains, passions, joys. We can show all that through real people. We can, I, 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 I know how, he said, you know, to relate people one to the other. And I know how through that to make statements in entertainment terms, small e, but in entertainment terms, because that's what we're in. I, I can make statements about what I believe is good, bad, evil, you know, something ought to be challenged. That's what he did. He, he transformed the cinema, not into uh, his, his uh, citation, as you know, said that he made an, it turned an industry into an art. And I think Charlie would have been apprehensive about the word art because Charlie believed that the movies were for everybody. They weren't. They weren't in a, uh, elitist in any sense. Of that sometimes art, the word art, seems to define. He meant through this magical instrument that photographed people that could then display these extraordinary magical images on that white spot at the end of a black tunnel you know it uh, oh no he was he was staggering absolutely staggering in the, in the steps and he permitted the rest of us with due humility i hope you know at the bottom of the mountain to to be able to follow in his footsteps and he was truly a, a very responsible filmmaker uh, commenting on, on social issues in modern times, the great dictator in particular, sure. which um, caused some degree of friction between uh, Charlie and his brother Sid, which sure. of course is portrayed in the film. Sure. Uh, was, was that relationship um, something that, that he wrote about candidly uh, in some of his memoirs? With Sid? Yeah. Uh, yes, I think it was. Sid, you see, Sid was, uh, Sid was a very remarkable figure in many ways. Uh, he was a performer, a relatively star performer, long before Charlie, both with Fred Carno and indeed on the screen. And, uh, but he was a very good businessman. People say that Charlie was a, a very shrewd businessman, and certainly he was no fool. But I think he owed an enormous amount to Sid. But the mo remarkable thing about Sid was that despite his own career and potential, he recognized that his young brother was uh, uh, in a class of his own. And he voluntarily gave up his career uh, in order to look after Charlie and to run the whole Chaplin outfit. Uh, he was a, a mysterious figure in, in some degree because, as you will know, large numbers of people uh, assume that Charlie was Jewish. Uh, Charlie was not Jewish. Uh, although the uh, Hoover files 
<coughs> like a note. Thornstein, I think they had him down as. That Chaplin was a phony name, they said, that his real name, I think it was Thornstein, something like that anyway. But Sid was half Jewish. In other words, Charlie's mother was Sid's mother, but she obviously had an affair with somebody who was Jewish. So that I'm very fond of the scene in the movie where Sid, having badgered Charlie to, to, to go into talkies, to move into talkies, as many other people did, this was in the middle 30s, uh, you must advance, Charlie, you, you mustn't be sub, sub, um, con uh, uh, contained, you mustn't be... Uh, 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 go with the times. Yeah, I've got, I can't think of the word I want. Uh, constrained, uh, you know, by by uh, by not going into movies. You must go into movies, uh, into into talkies. I mean, and and Charlie, of course, finally gave in on a subject which was the Great Dictator, and uh, and uh, Sid was furious with him because everybody said. Don't make this film. Uh, there were over 90% of Americans said that the United States should stay out of the war. Once war was declared, of course, Charlie was suddenly a genius. But my point is that in the argument, when Sid was getting furious with him, he said, what are you doing? This isn't your world. Why are you? You're, you're, a, you're a comic. And Charlie said to Sid, he said, and yes, and yes, Sid, you are a Jew. In other words, We'd just seen on the screen Nazism, fascism, all, all the anti-Semitism uh, manifestation in, in, under, under Hitler, and, uh, and that's what he was saying. He was, he was a passionate man, Charlie, passionate in, in his beliefs, passionate in his life, passionate in his affairs. You know, passion, passion, commitment drove Charlie. And obviously very stubborn and single-minded to be literally the only major filmmaker to wait a good 12 or 13 years after everyone else started making talking pictures. Sure. And in fact, City Lights and Modern Times both. Absolutely. Although they're not, as it, it, in watching those films and, and thinking about them, you, as with many of his officially silent films, you, you seem to hear them. He had that, <laughs> yes. that quality. Yes, yes. And of course, as you know, he, he scored uh, all the major movies, uh, while he was in Switzerland, when he ostensibly retired. Uh, I think it had something to do with maintaining the copyright, mind you, you know, that uh, copyright r had run out, but by putting music on, he renewed that copyright. What were the circumstances of your meeting with, with the real Charlie Chaplin? Um, well, in the 50s when I met him, uh, I mean, it was a sort of ridiculous situation. It was slightly embarrassing for me to tell, but you asked the question. Uh, I was uh, uh, in a restaurant in the south of France called Ville Neuf de, L de Loubet, Ville, Ville Neuf Loubet, I think it was called. And uh, uh, my wife and I had our children with us, and, and we went into a restaurant really quite early because of the children. And there was another family sitting over, the only other big table occupied with a lot of children. And obviously, they were there for the same reason, in order to get the children to bed at a reasonable hour. And the, the, they got up, and the man got up, he had white hair, turned around, and it was Chaplin. And I might have been seeing Beethoven, or, you know, Shakespeare, or, I mean, I, I, was, I was totally dumbfounded at suddenly being confronted with this god of mine, hero of mine. And he, good evening, and walked out, and so on. he got to the door, and Una obviously said something to him. And he came back into the restaurant, and he said, how do you do it? He said, um, my name's Charlie Chaplin, you're Richard Attenborough, aren't you? I, you're a very good actor, I admire your work. Very much. Which, I mean, hey, I mean, <laughs> I didn't care. I was on cloud seven, you know, I was uh, thrilled to death. And then as I told you, having just met him on that one occasion, he then wrote and asked if I, or rang, I don't remember, and asked if I'd take Annie. And then in the 70s, um, I'm, uh, one of the officials of the British Academy of Film and Television Arts, BAFTA, and we gave uh, Charlie a fellowship very properly. If he should have been number one. But he came to England, and he came quite a lot at that time. It was the time he got his knighthood, and, uh, and we made him a fellow and so on. And because I, w I hosted that event, and the Queen came to open the new building, and at that time she presented him 
with his fellowship and it was a very romantic time and very nostalgic and so on. And so he came to England quite a lot during that period and stayed at the Savoy Hotel. And I used to always go and see him. He used to send a message to say that he was coming and would I like to come and say hello and so on. So I knew him as a very old man. I mean, I knew him in his uh, middle 80s. And although he was not senile in any sense, he, he nevertheless, uh, his attention span was, uh, was not great. And you, you couldn't really talk about anything of any great depth. Uh, he wanted to talk, he wanted to chat, uh, except when Una left the room and you'd be sitting with he and Una and, and Una, I'd be talking to you and Una would be sitting here maybe and Una would get up and go into the bedroom or something. And so although he'd be talking to you, his eyes would actually stay on the bedroom the whole time. He'd continue to talk to you, but, but Una was over there and had gone out of that door and really it was difficult for life to continue quite, oh, and then she's back, and then back came the, the focus. It was, in, it was enchanting, yeah. He was in a chair, of course, in a wheelchair. I think one thing uh, about, about your film, Chaplin, that will um, impress younger viewers who might not be familiar with Chaplin's work is the tr his tremendous superstar status yeah. at that time. Oh, sure. Probably the most uh, recognized figure in, in the world. Oh, without question. I mean, when you, I mean, it's part of the measure of the, of the uh, uniqueness of the man. I mean, he and Doug Fairbanks and Mary Pickford and Griffiths founded United Artists at the end of the 20s. I mean, 1930, I think they actually founded uh, United Artists, 29, 30. 1919, I think. Was it? 19? It was early, yeah. Oh, it was earlier than that? 1919. Yeah. Really? I thought, I'm, I'm, I'm wrong. I thought it was uh, in the late 20s. Um, I, I beg your pardon, you're quite right, I'm so sorry, you're absolutely right, he was in his late twenties, you're quite right, it was 1919, it was he that was uh, 1929, 19, uh, he, was, he was 29, 30 years of age, uh, and, and he and Mary and Doug and Griffith and so on founded that. Now, for a person of that age to form that company and so on was quite extraordinary, and at the same time he was a millionaire, by virtue of the contracts that he'd signed. And at the same time, as you very properly say, he was without question the most famous man in the world. Now, for a young man in his 20s to find himself, like the Beatles, you know, except much more famous than the Beatles. Uh, very remarkable indeed. And of course, as you rightly say also, one of the leading figures, really leading figures in Los Angeles. And a very romantic man, I mean, wonderful charisma, very good looking, you know, not the little tramp that we know at all. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm reminded of, uh, there's some wonderful footage of Chaplin uh, doing uh, Liberty Bond uh, right. in Times promotions. Square, I think, probably. Yeah. Surrounded by screaming fans. Yeah. And, and certainly, I guess, they, Chaplin and Fairbanks and Pickford, all of whom are portrayed in the film, were really the, among the first true movie stars. Sure, absolutely. And absolutely. you uh, give us a... a, a an interesting insight in, into into that uh, with some of the Max Sennett uh, <laughs> yeah. Chaplin uh, confrontations. Yeah, uh, and of course Dan Aykroyd is is great fun. Oh, marvelous, marvelous! What a sweet man he is. I've never met him before, and I very much wanted him to play uh, Sennett, and he he did so with such grace and generosity, and he's been so charming about the movie because one of the problems that that I have with movies that, that I'm involved with. But people enjoy them, uh, I think, in the main, when they see them. The, 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 the problem is because I don't take subject matter and material which necessarily has an immediate cinematic appeal, uh, is to get people to come and see the movies. And, and so a program such as this, and, and when one's talking about them, one hopes people will be intrigued sufficiently. Now, Dan, who, what, as I don't know, 15 minutes on the screen, 20 minutes, something like that, uh, has been absolutely marvelous in his loyalty to the program and, his, and, and, and to the movie and, to, and his desire to try and promote the movie and, and uh, excite people by, uh, by talking about it and so on. He's a, an enchanting man, very funny and lovely in the movie. And it was also uh, a surprise of sorts to see uh, Marissa Tomei from My yes. Cousin Vinny yes. playing Mabel Normand. Yes. Well, that was before My Cousin Vinny, of course, a long, long time before My Cousin Vinny. 
uh, that was made after we uh, really? after after she'd done a little bit uh, at the beginning of Charlie. We were we were very lucky to have spotted her as it were ahead of time. And of course, uh, major uh, challenge in making the film was finding the right actor to play Chaplin. And Robert Downey Jr. I think really moves to uh, you know, a, a new kind of heights a, as an actor. Mm. Uh, of course, he's been in many films, uh, but you did a wonderful job with with him, and, and he's terrific in the picture. Oh, I think he's marvelous. I, I think he's uh, I think he's a huge talent. I think he has the charisma and looks and magic of of Tom Cruise, um, and Tom Cruise is a smashing actor too. But uh, but in addition to that, I think that. Robert has the uh, um, the dexterity and the span and the scope uh, of De Niro. I mean, he, 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 there's nothing beyond him. I mean, nothing beyond his capability. He's a brilliant young man, brilliant in every sense as far as an actor is concerned, but very bright too, you know. And for a young man aged 26, as he was, 27 now, uh, to be able to deal with the creation of that particular character and to have the diligence and the commitment month after month after month to uh, help create that figure, to take over. I mean, uh, Geraldine Chaplin was, uh, is extraordinary about him. I mean, it's said that uh, she feels in a way Robert has understood Charlie's soul, you know. And, uh, I mean, easy things to... to, to Charlie's left-handed in playing tennis and playing the violin. Now, it's very difficult if you're right-handed. That's how you naturally do that. To do this is, is very strange. Robert set about it. There's only four seconds of him playing the, the violin, but he wanted it to be correct. In the tennis scene, he plays with his left hand and so on. His commitment, Ro Robert stands on with his on, the, on his heels in a way. Charlie is sort of suspended like a marionette on, the, on a string and, uh, because of the dancers. W.C. Field he's probably said he was probably the greatest da ballet dancer who was never a ballet dancer. So he's on his toes all the time, you know. Now, Robert had to t change his entire stance. Uh, that he did over a period of time, get great pains in his back, you know, in, in doing it. But he actually became Chaplin. I mean, it's the most marvelous example of a, of a of a mind and a body being taken over by another character so that everything that he does, even if he improvised, his improvisation didn't go back to Robert Downey Jr., it was Chaplin who improvised this piece of work. Oh, he's, he's, he's wonderful. And, he, and what is very clever, and it was the reason I cast him, not because he could turn his toes out and twiddle a cane. I mean, any actor can do that. If he can't, he shouldn't have an equity card. You know, I mean, there's no way. But what Robert has is, is a, a, a mind behind his eyes, a, a wrestling, a debate, an intensity, a passion that is in, like fire in his eyes, which all the great cinema actors are able to, the great ones, I mean, Tracy and Robinson and so on, those sort of people, I mean, or, or, or actually Steve McQueen had it too, or Jimmy Dean had it, you know. Those are the, those are the, those are the magic figures, and this is what Robert has. It's very difficult to um, convey greatness, to convey genius, to uh, uh, and to, and and indeed to convey passion in in all its forms. And that's what Charlie was. Charlie was a man of unqualified passion in everything, most of all in his work. But of course, it was part of his relationship, his sexual relationships. His, Marriages, his children, his politics, all of it was driven by an inside fire that Robert has created. And I think his performance is very, very remarkable. I really do. One thing that's always impressed me about your, your films, uh, most of them are, are very epic in scope, mm. yet very intimate in, in characters. and you know, with hundreds of technicians uh, about, and how do you create that kind of atmosphere on the set to, to achieve this? Actors, as you, as you know, uh, are shy, uh, are certainly embarrassed, self-conscious um, when they're going to perform. 
under normal circumstances, traditionally, whether it be in the legitimate theatre or in vaudeville or whatever, you rehearse and rehearse and prepare your performance in privacy. You prefer it at home, but you basically prepare it in rehearsal uh, or in an empty theatre or whenever. You, you, you work until you say, now I'm at concert pitch, now I'm prepared to display myself, to bear myself uh, in front of, in front of a, a, an audience, in front of a public. Um, in the movies, you don't have that. In the movies, sometimes you do some rehearsal beforehand. But basically, you come onto the floor, and there and then, you have to show your wares. And you're not showing a painting, or a piece of writing, or a sculpture, or something. It's you, you, your, your body, you, you, your persona, present it. So the most to start with, what a director has to do, if he cares about the actors as against the pyrotechnics, which is my scene, I'm a bit old-fashioned in the way that I make my movies. I, I'm not all that interested in, in the advance of the techniques and so on. Uh, what interests me is what the movie has to say and how it's said, which is, as far as I'm concerned, through a subjective view, as far as the audience is concerned, of the actors and the actresses telling their story, reacting in, 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 in whatever way. So, I work, I'm not a dictator, well, I'm a friendly dictator, <laughs> but I create an atmosphere on the floor where everybody feels that they're contributing. It's not the position of an auteur. I, I hold the baton, I conduct the orchestra, uh, but I permit the um, double basses or the trombones or the timp or second violins or whatever, their own part. And particularly if it's a concerto, then I give the fiddle player or the piano player their place, as it were. But it is a group, and that group is the unit. 100, 120, 150 people. They all feel that they are there to contribute to the movie and that they have something to contribute. So that when the actor comes in and when he has to rehearse for the first time, he's rehearsing in front of 150 people who desperately want him to be good. There, there is an atmosphere of everybody is there, it's quiet, nobody, nobody's in, nobody reading a paper. Everybody is there to help prepare the platform upon which that actor can reveal himself. Now, if that works, then you have a, you have a head start, because the unit, ha he knows he's playing before a good house. Now, if, in addition to that, I can persuade the actress or the actor that they are the one person on earth capable of playing that part. Then again, you release the embarrassment and you bring out, in terms of an actor's relaxation, as against a tightness with nerves, you have a relaxation. You have a, an un, untied up stomach, I know, because I've just been acting and my stomach was in knots. Uh, but it, 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 you, by, by virtue of doing that, and by virtue of actually physically react, relaxing before you start, you allow your intuitive playing Cerebral it may be in some sense, but basically intuitive playing. You allow yourself to venture, to dare, to even risk failure in doing something magical. There's nothing that, you, that is constrained, nothing that is held back, because everybody and everything is for you. So that when somebody says to me, what do you love about making movies? I have no hesitation, what I know exactly what it is. Say, I want to say things, I want to express emotions, I want to campaign for this, I want to display my anger about that or whatever it is. Now, provided I can do it, and I must keep repeating this in entertainment terms, because we're not on a lecture platform or a political platform, we're in a mass entertainment medium. Provided I can do that, I do it through the actors. So it is working with the actors that I absolutely adore. And therefore, if I take pride in my movies, uh, in any sense, if I'm entitled to, it is by virtue of the overall standard of performance and the fact that 
um, Simon Ward who played young Winston or Tony Hopkins who played the lead in Bridge Too Far and Magic or Ben Kingsley in Gandhi and now uh, oh, Robert Washington and, uh, and Denzel Klein. Washington in Cry Freedom and they're relatively unknown players who I by virtue of my love of them and I fall in love with them all I mean I'm passionate about them all and, and, and bringing them together and giving them that opportunity is my excitement and my reward and Kevin Klein again in Chaplin plays <laughs> another very famous figure, <laughs> Douglas Fairbanks Senior. Yes, yes. Uh, Kevin, as you that. know, played as you just mentioned very kindly, uh, "Cry Freedom," and I, I rang Kev up and asked him if he would do it, and he said, "Dick, I'd swim a crocodile-infested river for you." He said, "Wait a minute, I already have." <laughs> Uh, Anthony Hopkins, who of course you've yeah. worked with on uh, several occasions, um, plays uh, a, a writer working with Chaplin on yeah. his autobiography in yeah. the film. Uh, how did that that you arrive at that structure? I know there are, <coughs> are three uh, writers credited on the screenplay, in addition to the story by Diana Hop uh, Hawkins, uh, William Boyd, yes, Brian and Brian Forbes, Forbes, and Bill Goldman. How did that was? Were they rewrites or? Yes, yes. Uh, it was not part of the original structure. And um, the first screenplay ran about four hours. Um, I, the preview the other day, uh, <laughs> I've been, you know, working with Steven Spielberg on Jurassic Park, and uh, Steven said, uh, I'm coming to your preview. I said, oh my God, no, please don't come, Steven. I'd be much too nervous anyway. But no, he said, I'm coming and I'm going to sit next to you and hold your hand because I know what hell those occasions are. So he came to the preview. And at the end of the preview, he got up, I got up. He took me in his arms and whispered all sorts of quite outrageously generous remarks. And then he said, but you know, there's, there's one major fault with your movie. And I thought, oh dear, I'm sad because I, would, I admire him and like him so much. I would love it to be unqualified, his, his pleasure and so on. He said, your movie is an hour too short. And, I, and I, it's the first time anybody ever told me that a movie that I've made was too short rather than too long. Uh, but this is, the, this is the great problem. This is, was the enormous problem with the movie, that there was so much to get in, so much we wanted to put in, and it's such a complex and long life, and, and yet you've got to show 80, 90 percent of it because, in period terms, because one impinges, one period impinges on another. And this was a terrible problem. And uh, I really had resisted an idea of a normal flashback, you know, reporter, dictator, and then what happened, Mr. Chaplin, you know. But fortunately, I knew a man called Max Reinhardt, who was Charlie's publisher and uh, he was a great friend of Charlie's and Charlie would never have an editor in fact he refused to have an editor but he did discuss the biography with Max and because it was discussed with Max I suddenly realized of course that we needn't have and then what happened Mr. Chaplin I mean we could actually have somebody saying Charlie that's bullshit I mean, that's crap. Don't give me that stuff, Charlie. I was there. I know what happened. Or you can't refer to such and such a character uh, as being a bitch and so on. You're the devil. You married her at the age of so-and-so. She gave you two children. I mean, you really think that she was... etc., etc. So that instead of having a straight, rather cold, objective commentary, by virtue of this idea of putting these two men together, looking at the, the, the galleys, the proofs uh, of the fir or first draft, if you like, of, of the autobiography, we could actually have comment and argument and observation. And Bill wrote that, Bill Goldman wrote that, and uh, marvelously, I think. And f subsequently, when we finally got the, uh, the uh, shape of the movie together, then Diana uh, did some more writing on that and covered the elements which we thought needed illustrating. And you also have the opportunity to kind of play with some of the conventions of uh, a biopic. Yes. For example, how did Chaplin arrive at his tramp outfit? Yes. And that wonderful scene where 
as he recalls, the, yes. it was kind of like the Ruby Slippers of Oz. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and to turn it, you as a director, to turn it into a stylized yes. sequence like that yes. was, was great fun. And uh, very good. unexpected, I might add. I wonder, I <laughs> as well as, of course, the, uh, the scene where he's cutting the film uh, on the run. On the run, yes. And it turns into a Chaplin yes. picture. Well, it seemed to me that that's what it was, in a way. It was one of those ridiculous... Uh, chases, sort of Keystone Cop chases, you know, <laughs> across the country and attempting to do this uh, final editing in lavatories and bathrooms and bedrooms and so on in order not to have the uh, the uh, film uh, confiscated on, uh, for the court case. How did you just deal with what sequences, what great Chaplin sequences to, you know, recreate or include? Oh, I, mean, no, no. I mean, I... Uh, those decisions are so arbitrary, aren't they? I mean, they really are. And it's terribly difficult. I mean, I, I keep saying to myself, how can we have made a film and not show Limelight, or not show Verdu, or with all its comment, as it were, on his own life, etc. But you... you, you <coughs> we were saying earlier, I mean, Chaplin is a man of unqualified passion. Passion Almost everything is derived in terms of his life from that passion. So you say, well, now what is the what story we're we going to tell? What, 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 what are the cr basic criteria by which we're going to set out? And you start off, I hope, as the movie does, by saying, well, we have to see what is behind this public image, this public face. And so, as you saw, we start off with the black and white image of the of the tramp. Uh, and uh, slowly he removes his moustache, his eyebrows, his makeup, and so on. This is just through the titles, as you know. And gradually the picture comes into color, because of course we come not to the black and white clown, but to the reality behind that image. And so the, the picture is now in full color. What we're saying is that there is a, a world and a life which we, the public, don't know about. So you say, well, okay. Let's start with his public life. Now, his public life is movies. He made, you know, 85 movies, 54 of which were so-and-so, etc., 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 etc. Those aren't correct figures, but uh, illustrating. Of those movies, what were the significant ones? Well, the immigrant. The immigrant has to be there because Charlie was an immigrant in many ways coming to America. And the whole question of the European genesis and so on. And we say, well, now, well, City Lights has to be probably his greatest movie, perhaps under certain circumstances. Then you have to have the kid, because the kid launched him in the first full length. Then what about his comment about automation and, and the, you know, the, the whole question of human dignity and the loss of pride in one's work and so on? We've well, got to have that. And, of course, his greatest statement of all was great dictator when he opposed Hitler, etc., 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 uh, and, well, my gosh, we've now got six. How many more can we put in? Perhaps we put a little bit of that or a little bit of that. And so you've all no already said, where's the circus, where's Verdu, you know, where, 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 etc. Where's Lime like? And the last two were perhaps being very arrogant. I really didn't think the last two were uh, King in New York and Countess in Hong Kong were, were of the same caliber, perhaps. Uh, so arbitrarily you say, well, that's the career we're going to look at apart from the very early movies that he attempted to make with Senate and, and, uh, and the other companies that he was involved in. Then you say, well, okay, also in that public life uh, is his social and political feelings and passions. I mean, Charlie was, Charlie was um, uh, uh, in no way a communist. I mean, not in a million years was he a communist. As he described himself, he was a humanist. And uh, all he cared about, really, was about those emanating like, in large degree from the very early beginnings that he owned. He had himself with the deprivation in the Victorian era, the workhouse, and no food, and a drunken father, and a, a mother who he had to commit to a, a mental asylum at the age of 13. Uh, you know, I mean, that, all that coming together affected deeply his attitude uh, in, in and defense of uh, the, those who couldn't defend themselves. And so that became his, his, his political aspiration. There was, 
There was a, a sweet story which I learned flying over here some time ago when we were scripting, and Sam Goldwyn Jr. was on the plane, and uh, he told us the story that his father, the great Sam, uh, was in fact interviewed by the FBI about Charlie, and they asked Sam Goldwyn, they said, was Chaplin a member of the Communist Party? And Goldwyn replied, no way, he said he was too mean to pay the dues. <laughs> and, that was, and Sam Goldwyn Jr. told us this, and we put it in the script as you in the screenplay, as you probably well imagine, uh, as you remember. Uh, but that was his public side. Now he went to his private side and said, well, how what do we know? We looked at private papers and letters. We, we discovered this extraordinary relationship which he uh, had with this young girl, 16-year-old girl, when he was 19, to whom he proposed marriage without ever even having kissed her, only taken her out two or three times, fell hopelessly, idyllically in love with Hetty Kelly. And all through his writings and through his thoughts, even up to the time of Limelight, Claire Bloom was saying that the character she played, he would say, well, Hetty would have looked like this, and Hetty would have done that, and so on. So you say, well, that's where that began. Now, did, do we think, Hetty dominate his uh, proclivities? Was, was, was Hetty the, 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 the search for another Hetty, the search for a virginal creature with whom he could fall in love and so on and have a sexual relationship, which is always what he never had with Hetty? Is that part of his private life? You say, well, it probably is. And if it is, that's perhaps what we should now be concentrating on that area. What about his wives? You can't leave his wives out. If you put one of the wives in, who could you leave out? You might leave out Lita. You can't leave out the first one. If you leave out Lita, what about the two sons? And so you go on, and so you come to private life and the strands there, public life and the strands there. And like a, like a cable, you, a rope, you try and entwine them round into some sort of political dynamic. But overriding them all is this passion that drove him, this passion overall for work, so that all those private affairs, even the political questions, are marginalized on the altar of his work. I mean, that, that, that took precedence over everything. So even if he had the, the affair of all time last week with this gorgeous looking bird, you know, that went to the wall. It was gone when he was back on his work, as with his wives, as with his politics, as with everything else. And so you arrive at an arbitrary decision to include this and exclude that. God knows whether it's right or wrong, but you have to go by your own passion, by your own commitment, by your own view, by your own excitement. And uh, that's how you arrive at a screenplay. Uh, who's to say whether it's right or wrong? Who's to say whether it should be done another way or uh, starting from a different premise? I don't know, but that was the way we decided. Wait, your movie is also a, a great... Ten more minutes. Sorry. I think you need a little water. Ah, yeah. <coughs> ten. Mm. ten. Okay. <coughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Terrific. Okay. Um, I just. Uh, are we on? Yeah. I'd love to just get some kind of shorthand impressions, uh, if you will, of some of the people that you've worked with. Uh, yeah. Uh, of course, in your first film, in which we serve working with Noel Coward and David Lean. I believe yes. that was his first film as a director. It was David's, yes. David, when Coward uh, wanted to do In Which We Serve, um, in, people liked the idea of him writing it and even playing it. Nobody wanted him to direct it, and he was absolutely determined, come a hell or a high water, he was going to do it. And so eventually somebody said, well, look, if you are going to direct it, what you really need is a sensational editor. He, Mr. Coward, is the person who cuts the film, puts it together, and, and balances the scenes, and so on. And the best editor in England was a young man called David Lean. And after about three weeks, uh, Noel Coward fell for him so much and uh, thought he was so brilliant, so extraordinary, so perceptive, and so helpful that he announced to the whole unit that he would from then on be the co-director. And indeed, the movie was shaped, although the actors were dealt with by Noel in directing and so on, David shaped the movie. David shot the movie with uh, another director photographing it, Ronald Neem, and uh, another director operating it, Guy Green. 
Uh, and but of course, it was directed the Angry Silence. Who directed the Angry Silence? Picture Absolutely, one of the, one of yeah. the pictures you yeah. produced. Yeah. Uh, Steve McQueen, of uh, course, working with him in The Sand Pebbles and The Great mm. Escape. Yeah, if somebody said to me, what actor, apart from Edward G. Robinson, to whom I was absolutely devoted, I suppose the actor I miss, no, that's not quite true, Edward G. Robinson, Olivier, and Steve. And Steve was a, was a, was a, became a great friend. And the other two were not close friends. Steve was. I did two movies with him. And uh, I was devoted to him. He was a passionate man. He was a man who cared, gave all the wonderful relaxation, laid back feeling, you know. And yet he had a passion for getting what he wanted to do right, for, for demanding the quality that he believed was required, particularly in the script. He gave the screenwriters hell until he felt it was absolutely right. I think that if Steve had lived, um, he would have been amongst the giants. He would have been Tracy of his generation. He was a wonderful, wonderful screen actor. And a very different kind of actor, John Wayne. Ha ha ha, Duke. Yes, I can't say that I found myself at one with Duke's political affiliations or uh, principles, but uh, as far as a professional is concerned, I mean, he was wonderful. He knew it backwards. He knew every key light. He knew every angle. He knew every lens. I'll just break off to tell you one story about, it was a film, not, not a very good film, uh, called uh, Brannigan. And uh, uh, Duke was a, a, a Chicago copper policeman who came over to, to England uh, to, to, to try and break up a drugs ring or something, I can't remember. And I was the guy from Scotland Yard. I was the English policeman. Now, we had to stage a fake fight uh, in order to, for the plot and so on. And, in, and I was supposed, in, I was in a pub, uh, leaning on a bar, and he was at the other end of the bar. And I had to knock out Duke Wayne. Now, Duke must be, what, six foot seven? I don't know. And I'm foot five foot seven. And the only way I can manage that, which is, I don't know if it's evident in the movie, is that we had to build a ramp. I mean, Duke was here, standing on the ground, and I was here, and in order to be able to get my fist on his chin, I had to walk up this ramp, which I hope nobody noticed, in order to be able to knock him out, <laughs> which eventually I was supposed to do. <laughs> I was a great character, Duke. Yeah. Well, Sir Richard, it's been a great treat speaking with you and uh, again congratulations on the film and thank you. Uh, we'll look forward to your next picture thank you very much I hope, uh, with it within the next four years <laughs> thank you